today we have with us nile deshmukh who is uh, who graduated with vyaj from mmc in 1992 nile uh, during his internship nile had an opportunity to work with charles korea during the internship nile worked on several projects including british consulate in india and ayuka a local project in pune subsequently nile pursued his masters in urban and regional planning from sept university Ahmedabad in 1994 and 95 during that time nile had the opportunity of working at vastu shil foundation by bb doshi when nile worked on the master plan of vandra kurla complex in mumbai in 1998 nile graduated with masters of architecture from university of illinois and urbana campaign and decided to pursue his career in healthcare architecture Since then Nile has worked on numerous healthcare facilities in the US a new healthcare academic campus in Istanbul Turkey an academic medical center in Chai and an orthopedic rehabilitation facility in Haiti Nile is currently a senior healthcare architect at Shepley Bulfinch and visiting scholar at Texas A&M University and brings over two decades of experience in healthcare planning and design he is passionate about envisioning and creating environments that enhance wellness and healing nile is interested in evidence based design and research and specializes in in, uh, in planning and designing children's hospital academic medical centers and specialty healthcare facilities to address their long term and immediate needs frequently under challenging constraints such as tight line lines limited resources and challenging sites we welcome you nile for this five days five alumni and five international cities webinar series It's been hectic and it's been grilling for you that I've been calling you all the time and messaging regarding the presentation and the uh, you know to work the logistics thank you you graciously accepted our invitation without any hesitation without any constraints and with this uh, varying time schedules and logistic you actually accepted and you are here with us today thank you so much for gracing us and over to you Thank you, Arti. That was a fabulous introduction. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so this is this is kind of a different talk in a way for me. Every single day, I talk about my work with my clients and users and whatnot. This this is the, this made me think because this is um, something very different that than, than what I normally do, uh, and I wanted. to talk about certain things that you would or the students would remember than just showing uh, pretty pictures so with that uh, so this is what arti had asked. so by the way i'm calling arti arti by her first name uh, i know she's uh, she's a faculty and um, uh, madam to you but for me she is a junior and other than that i'm just not used to calling people sir ma'am um, in the environment that i live so no disrespect um, it's just that that's what i'm used to calling arti as arti and others yeah, no, no. you can uh, <laughs> call me arti uh, uh, together in college and of course uh, you have been my senior so you have that privilege of calling me my name thank you all right thank you um so so when i emailed arti what am i going to talk about so this is what she said in couple of lines talk about the strengths that each one of you meaning students uh, may have as graduate architects and what are they what are their avenues for them uh, that is for you and then talk about my work uh, diversity and inclusion in the workplace so i'm going to try to talk about these things first and then if we get to my work uh, given time we'll get to it which is not as important in my opinion so let's talk about so i broke it into three pieces three segments to talk about what your potential may have a lot of us have a lot of good qualities it is just matter of somebody bringing it to surface and then sometimes it's matter of realization that what is it that you are good about so instead of talking about me and my work and my um 
my own strengths. I thought about my uh, qualities or things, how other people in my own life have uh, been my teachers and how they have contributed to bringing or shaping me in general. So I, these teachers include young and old, um, poor and rich, doesn't matter. They are other human beings that I faced um, in my life, and those are my teachers. And that's how I ranked, in a way, what are the things that I value the most. I learned having a right attitude that matters. And I learned that from my coworkers. So these are the these are my junior coworkers that pretty much they came right out of college, just like you and you would, um, most of you, right, coming from the school. I learned that having uh, knowledge is not enough. Having skills is not enough. What you need the most is your attitude. Having the right attitude matters. So um, I'll just give you one good example. When I said don't restrict your, uh, get restricted by your own knowledge, what it means. I'll give you one uh, story or a joke. So two friends, one American and another Indian friends go to, they don't know driving, so they go to a driving school and says to the instructor that um, we both want to learn driving. So the instructor says, okay, to the American guy, uh, how much of driving do you know? He says, nothing, zero. I have never driven a car. So the other, uh, other guy, Indian guy, he says, I know driving. Uh, I have driven in India for four years. I have driving license. So what are the charges and time it will take? So the instructor says to the American guy, it will be 10 lessons for you over 10 days, $60 each, $600. The Indian guy, he says it's going to be $1,000 and it's going to take you 16, 16 days, $60 a piece. And the Indian guy is like, how come? Because I know driving. And he says, that is why. First six lessons that I have to give you is to make you unlearn what you have learned in India. Then I'm going to start teaching you from scratch. So the point is, don't carry that burden on you that you know too much. So be open, uh, be a learner. So when I started working with these individuals, Elizabeth Tyler, uh, CY, Michael, Haifeng, they were very receptive. And that's what, uh, in my opinion, matters. So be receptive, not don't, don't get, carry the burden of your own uh, skills and knowledge that you have. Second point is that I really learned what having a strong passion means and that um, I learned from uh, Charles Korea. Uh, so when I was working with Charles Korea, and I don't know how lucky I was to get that internship with Charles Korea, um, he was a very passionate person. So I want you to think about what is it that you would love to do day after day, month after month, year after year, because if you don't find that, and I think, uh, who uh, who was it last week? I think it was Dheeraj from London who talked about passion his whole life. It seemed like is a living example of what passion means. So find that in yourself. Uh, I'll give you an example how I got influenced um, while working with Charles Korea. So Jitin Rilade, one of my friends, and I uh, did internship together with him. Jitendra was working on things and I was working on a few things. This is a British consulate uh, in, in Delhi. So he had a, a meeting with Howard uh, Hodgkin, who, who was a, a painter um, from London. Uh, in, so he had a, meet, a meeting in Delhi. So day before or a couple of days before, we made a model, Jitendra and I, that was a styrofoam, white styrofoam model, uh, very crude in a way. So the model looked like a picture. I don't have the real model picture, but uh, that it kind of looked like the picture on the top, uh, top left corner. And then uh, Sabi, one of our managers, uh, another architect that he was going to go with. So Sabi and he were going to catch six o'clock flight 
to go to Delhi next day morning. So the evening before, Jitendra and I left and everything was set. We had a nice model for him to take. Next day, they both went, came back in the evening. We didn't know. Uh, the next day, I said, so Sabi brought the model back. It looked like trash. I said, Sabi, what happened here? The model that we gave you was so much neater and well-finished. And he said, no, Charles was here last night. Uh, he went home after you guys, and he said he just couldn't fall asleep. His design wasn't working. So he came back to office three o'clock in the morning, broke apart your model, remade it in his own ways. And that's what we took for the meeting. And that's why it looked like this. And um, so he was there working on that model from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. and caught a six o'clock flight. So hearing that made me think, here is a guy who we admire so much. He's well published. He has so many uh, acclaimed projects and he is the one that says one of his projects bothered him so much that he didn't sleep all night. So having a strong passion is, is, is something that you need to find within yourself. Sense of purpose. This I believe I learned more from Bibi Doshi than anybody else. So this was a short period of time that I had chance to work with him. I worked mostly with Utpal Sharma and I used to go to uh, the office and uh, it was limited interaction to be honest with you, with, with Bibi Doshi. Um, but anytime he would, I was working on Bandra Kurla complex project with Utpal um, and anytime uh, Bibi Doshi would talk about things or he would look at our design uh, his favorite was, word was shamate in Gujarati, um, meaning uh, what are you doing? What are you doing for? Uh, what's the purpose? Um, so uh, that was a good learning for me, so to say, that what you do is just not, you're not doing randomly. There needs to be purpose behind what you do. And Utpal's uh, great teachings for me was effort that he would keep his favorite line was karo, 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 meaning do it, do it, uh, keep doing it. Um, so purpose, finding purpose with your passion uh, is uh, important. Not to be judgmental. This is uh, my first interaction with somebody here, uh, Bill Cooler. Um, so I, I have to tell you this story. Don't try this with your own career. This is, uh, don't follow this. Um, so after I graduated from University of Illinois, at that time, the economy was great and uh, the, the companies or the firms would come to the, uh, come to the university to interview you. Uh, it was called job fair. So I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew that I was going to work for a healthcare company or a firm. So I set up an interview uh, for with this firm uh, uh, called BSA Design at the time. And I marked my calendar. It was going to be eight o'clock in the morning, Tuesday morning. And uh, these are the times when there were no iPhones, no cell phones, no reminders for you. So I had to physically mark my calendar. Somehow I mistook that Tuesday for Monday or something. And I completely forgot that I had interview at eight o'clock in the morning and I did not go. Um, and as I said, there were no cell phones for anybody to call me. So I used to come for lunch home. When I came home for lunch after doing my classes, um, there, was a, um, there was a message on my answering machine, the home answering machine, the device used to record uh, people's uh, messages. And the message was from the uh, council, from the office, career council office, that you messed up your interview. Um, you had interview at eight o'clock in the morning, and you messed it up. So, as a part of our our um, protocol, you have to go back at five o'clock in the evening after uh, the person has done with all other interviews. Uh, and apologize. I said, okay. So I went in with my backpack. I had my portfolio in my backpack and shorts and a t-shirt. That's how I went for it uh, to say, okay, I'm going to just apologize to this person and um, end the matter. I messed it up. So Bill was there. I said, uh, my apologies. I totally forgot. I'm otherwise very punctual, but I don't know what happened. He said, just calm down. Don't worry about it. 
this is this is happens we all make mistakes i can completely understand that you could have uh, messed up your some way along the line that you forgot about the interview so sit down so we sat there for not only an hour maybe two hours talking to each other we shared port- my portfolio his stories my stories he ended up hiding me out of all other people um he didn't let that incident in any ways uh, reflect on how he evaluated me so that was a good lesson for me so don't try this with your first interview it could be very dangerous um i learned how to listen and when i say i learned this is probably not the best term because learning means you have completely learned something i should say i am learning a lot of these things i can only claim certain things that i learned but most of the things i am still learning so ability to listen so by listening i don't mean just by not interrupting people let them finish their sentences i mean lo- listen with your mind open listen what other people have to say um accept it absorb it we all have different opinions it's not always about you so be receptive uh, so prem was our director at school of planning um he had lived a lot of his life in the us and then he had come back so he was the first person that i i thought he could listen and there is there is a reason um that we should all listen to each other meaning understand each other i learned that respect cannot be demanded this is one of my bosses um bobby young um she was a retired um air force officer and then she changed her career got into architecture so what i learned from her she never made any of us feel like that she was a boss she was the captain of the ship she was part of the ship she was part of the team and all she had to give was respect to everybody it was never like i am the boss and i am the ruler here i never ever felt while working with her that she was my boss so respect other people do not demand respect it will come to you if you uh, respect other people it will come to you don't be hungry for power don't be hungry to demand respect i learned and i'm learning that uh, learning does not stop does not, never stops and that this is my colleague uh, linda hagerty past colleagues so one thing i'm trying to do is not mention any people that i currently working with just because um i don't want to get in the political limbo of favoritism but um these are my uh, people that came to my life and these are from the past so they are not currently working with me so avoid the temptation of copy paste just because you have done something before doesn't mean that's what you are going to carry over do not repeat yourself try as if every project is different every every task is different because if every problem is unique your answer to the problem should also be unique so linda was the first one that i i thought she would truly start any project any task right from scratch um so do not repeat yourself i am learning what empathy means from komal soni one of my friends she currently now lives in india she was in the us before but um, empathy comes from an ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes it's not about you when we say amitabh bachchan is a great actor he is a great actor because he understands the role that he's playing if you are designing for somebody you have to understand who your user of the space is what are they expecting what are they facing so do not design anything for magazines and pictures design things for the end user so be able to put yourself in the um, other person's shoes i am learning how to pick myself up from my father and my young daughter um she's not young anymore well she's still a lot younger than i she's 16 years old now but um celebrate your future uh, failures what i mean by celebrating failures is let your failures not be stumbling block for you failures are going to come if you're going to walk uh, just like our days 
crying over there by catching her um, fingers in the door. If you're going to walk, you're going to fall. If she's, she was standing to learn, uh, learn to stand, she is going to get in trouble. Don't punish yourself. If you have failed doing something, let that be a ladder for your next step. So without failures, what's the fun in life? Um, and this is my own. This I was going to go do the last thing in the presentation, but I thought with all other things that I have to say and um, what I have to show, I might forget. Um, I'm going to, I'm just saying, don't let money buy you. Or I, I learned not to let money buy myself. What that means is never sacrifice your own values, your own passions, your own mind to surrender to money. Do not do that. Money is a big uh, illusion that the humankind has created. Do not fall for that. Okay, so the second part of our this, uh, question was, what are the avenues? So avenues are many. Um, I'm not uh, going to be able to answer that question for you. Your avenues are your avenue. This was my journey. Um, this is not going to be your journey. We each have our own. So do not follow me. Do not follow anybody else for that matter. So um, just just make your path. There are many things that you can do in life. I can guide you. Anybody can guide you certain ways, but um, the paths are going to be different. Uh, so let's change the gears to, then she, she said, talk about your work, diversity and inclusion. So I'm going to talk about the diversity and inclusion first, and then we'll uh, get to the work part. So with the diversity and inclusion, uh, when I made that, this wrote this statement um, on the weekend, it felt like I was writing as if I was uh, similar to John F. Kennedy's statement about well, do not ask what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It sounded like, it sounded like that and I kind of like it. Um, so ask not what if society could include you, ask you as designer, if you could include the diversity in the society. And I'll get to that in a minute. So just, I want you to zoom out a little bit. This is the James Webb telescope that we recently sent in the space. One of the pictures from there. Every single dot that you see in the space is a galaxy, millions and millions of miles away. Where we are in this galaxy, who knows? At least I don't know. Uh, so each, so the, where I circled could be a galaxy by in itself. Who knows the beginning and um, end of these uh, darts in the o uh, ocean, so to say, of space. You probably have read, may, may of, many of you may know this already about mitochondrial uh, Eve. So this is the set of DNA that runs from mothers to daughters and daughters to daughters and so on. So when they go back and look at the, the, this DNA that go only travels from mothers to daughters, there is only one link that could be found that's about 200,000 years old um, with one woman. So her DNA exists in every single one of us. All 7.8 to 8 billion people on the earth come from single mother. That's how different we are. So why I'm in, uh, telling you this is more than our similarities, we tend to find differences. So you can call Mukesh Ambani tomorrow and say, hey, hey Mukesh, we are all brothers and sisters. Send me a $1,000 check um, to share your wealth. Um, that's not what I mean. That, so don't get engaged too much into how different we are. We are a lot more similar to each other then we are different. So National Human Genome Research Institute says that all human beings are 99.9% .9 identical in their genetic makeup. The differences are in remaining 0.1%. That's how different we are from each other. So if that 0.1% diversity is a fact, inclusion is an act. And how you as designer uh, could respond to that is my uh, question to you. One of the inclusion matters, the factor is uh, disability. A lot of us are not, a lot of us are not same. 
so this this is not uncommon sight um, in India to find. Uh, I don't mean to just say India. A lot of places on this planet, the U.S. might be one or a few other countries that embraces um, accessibility and made it into a priority. Um, but a lot of uh, other places, including India, uh, the accessibility is not there. We completely tend to ignore needs for people, those who are not able. Um, that little girl standing outside or waiting outside has no access to get in that, uh, whether it's a shopping mall or whatever, including hospitals. I have seen hospitals with polished marble steps. Are you going to... Uh, and when I look at that, that the slippery surface is in the rain and water with polished marble, did you do that just to take nice pictures? Or are you trying to make business for the hospital by making more people fall? So think about it. That Don't just say, and if you make it into priority, can you design something nice? So all these pictures that are on the screen, these are beautiful design. What they do is also accept the fact that I have to design something to uh, accommodate um, handicap accessible people, people that are not able to take the stairs. Uh, the bathroom up uh, on, on the left-hand corner, it's not dirty looking, bad looking, ugly looking bathroom at all. It's just that it has all the provisions that are needed. So if you make it into a priority, you can do it. Um, this is from Kapil Sharma show. As much as I love Kapil Sharma show, whenever they talk about this uh, character, I think it's Bacha Yadav. Um, all they have to talk about, joke about, is his appearance, how fat he is and how thick his neck is and how he looks like a cow or a buffalo. A lot of um, comments about that. Why? Oh, it just, do we talk about anybody having cancer on national TV? Do we joke about it? We don't. So obesity is a complex disease and people know it. Those who are suffering with it, they know it. You are not the one who need to uh, tell them that you are fat uh, and uh, laugh or make a joke out of it. So if you don't take anything away from to my today's talk, um, at least be sensitive. Um, so these are the provisions that in that we make in healthcare. Again, none of these bath so provisions to so that the patient um, is able to walk, the patient is able to go himself or herself to the bathroom. No th thresholds in the bathroom, white doors, um, and the toilets are uh, made strong enough, and all these provisions. You as designer could do these things. Um, instead of ignoring. All you have to do is make it into a priority. Cultural and religious diversity. We all come from different backgrounds and we have to respect that. So before I uh, talk about this slide here, um, why I think being professional, you have to be true to your profession. So you, you probably all have heard about Boston Marathon bombing that happened back in, I think, 2014 or uh, around that time. So there were two bombers that in the pressure cooker, they put a bomb and the marathon, a lot of people got hurt. Um, and the whole Boston uh, was angry. So one of the two bombers, the older one, he got hurt with the police and he was brought into the hospital um, in, I think it was uh, Bethesda Deaconess Medical Center. He was brought in. He had a lot of injuries. So the doctors worked on him all night and then there was a press conference next day morning and the chief of the surgeon, he said, we tried this, we tried that, we tried that, but we were not able to save him. His injuries and the blood loss was so much that we just couldn't do it. We couldn't save him. And here were the Bostonian, Bostonians thinking, why in the world you have to save him? Why are you even trying? He deserves to die. Well, they did what they were supposed to do as professionals. Their job was to try to save him when he was brought there as a patient. They did not take law into the hand and say, why we, we take the law in our hand. That's up to the law to decide whether he's a, he's a criminal or not. They did what they wanted to do. So that's how you have to true to your profession. So don't don't let your beliefs be in the way. So this is a, this is Boston Children's Hospital parking garage on the left-hand side. The idea here was uh, 
to create a bridge. It's a long bridge. This is not designed by uh, our firm or me. Um, this was one of the projects that they had. I used to go to the steering committee meetings and I would learn not only about our project, but other projects too, because it was a children's is a big organization. They have multiple projects going on at the same time. So the idea of the designer was to put imagery of birds um, on that bridge. It's a long bridge, so something that will um, that will keep you motivated walking that long bridge along the way for the small children. So the imagery was going to include swans, other birds, and ravens, and all that. Along the way, what they learned that ravens are not con are considered messenger of death in Middle Eastern culture, and the whole idea would change. It's not designer didn't say, oh, that's that's out in the Middle East. Who cares? So we do get uh, visitors from all or the bus and children do get visitors from all over the world. So designer's job is not to say, not to ignore it. Uh, you, you have to embrace the diversity. Uh, this is an example of um, a space that we have in the hospital. I don't have the recent pictures. So I use the rendering. But anyhow, the point is, um, so there is a small little chapel in the hospital that we uh, we have, uh, the hospital has for people to come, uh, reflect, meditate, uh, relieve their stress, whatever. But in Middle Eastern culture, in Islamic culture, before they pray, uh, the practice or customary is that they like to wash their feet. Generally speaking, there is no foot washing space or foot, foot washing um, um, provision made in any bathroom that you cannot stand sit down and wash your feet so after learning that we made a point to include that uh, in the design and um, so that people can wash their feet before they um, before they pray other gender specific needs so when my daughter was born 16 years ago 17 years ago now there in generally speaking there were not um, as many uh, places where women can breastfeed the child or pump the milk. Now it is becoming more common and more and more we are designing uh, requirements for the working mothers to incorporate. These are the small little uh, cubicles. It doesn't need to be a uh, big space. It just needs to be small enough that the woman feels comfortable uh, feeding the child. So as a designer, you just have to, that's part of the diversity. LGBTQ community. Now, again, um, India has come far along from uh, when I was living in India to this point. Um, but as designers, what is it that we can do? So this is an example at um, Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, uh, very close uh, from where I live. Uh, so there are no gender specific bathrooms here or uh, toilets. And this is for men and this is for women. This is for uh, for all uh, sorts of students, they don't necessarily have to reveal their gender identity because gender identity is not always very visible. It's a very personal issue to many people. So uh, that's how the designers us uh, can um, can include this diversity. There are other um, uh, other needs in the society, such as mental health, cognitive ability, vision impairment. So as I said earlier, um, empathy comes from ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So think from these standpoints, don't design anything just for pictures. Uh, that will happen. And just as a reminder, uh, when I say don't design anything just to take pictures, our primary responsibility in this field is to safeguard public health, safety and welfare. So don't forget about that aspect. Okay, so let's change about my work. Um, so I have done several projects. I, I didn't count. Um, and I don't, um, I, it would have been a nice exercise for me to go back and see, but I didn't count. So instead of talking about all my projects and work, um, that you will not remember for too long. You will forget in a matter of days. Um, what I want to talk to you about is the process. And I'm going to pick one project 
a very recently uh, completed project at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, so Boston Children's Hospital is um, a teaching hospital for Harvard Medical School. It's right next to the uh, right, um, Harvard Medical School, and it's uh, one of their teaching hospitals. So I will talk about the process, not necessarily the project uh, in itself. So just to introduce you, uh, the yellow box is where the site was created, so to say, uh, for the project. So it's a very dense um, urban environment. Uh, the site was created by demolishing two old buildings that were no longer um, practical for them. And then there was a small garden there. So uh, we had to replace that garden in terms of our design because garden is not something that gets replaced uh, here in the United States where easily people don't give up on garden spaces or open spaces so easily. So we had to incorporate all that garden spaces into the design in form of uh, roof gardens and interior gardens and other garden spaces that would be more useful for the patients to use. Um, in terms of the process, the, this process doesn't look too different probably from what you guys are used to, uh, starting from master planning, schematic design, design development, construction document. That's pretty uh, similar to what you know um, in terms of overall components of the projects. A um, lot of patient rooms, 150 patient rooms, um, cat labs, ORs, ORs stands for uh, operating theater. That's what, uh, that's how it's referred in India. So anytime if I say OR, that means operating theater. And then a um, lot of support spaces within the hospital, just to give you gist. So as I started out saying that you have to design for who your real client is. So in this respect, uh, who's my client? Uh, is it the facilities department that hired me? Is that my real client? No, they, they do act as a client, but my real client is the patient, their families and the clinicians. So the whole design process revolves around, uh, around the patient being at the center. So this is a quick structure. Uh, how the process goes through. The, there is at the top is the steering committees, couple of steering committees that look at um, what these, uh, what we are doing, and then lot of lots and lots of users, which include clinicians, uh, that we interact very uh, regularly to understand uh, with the, to help us with design. And these two things on the right-hand side is uh, something probably you have not come across. So one is the patient family advisory group, which is uh, basically they are unrelated to the hospital. These are the patients and families who have been to the hospital prior. So we get a lot of input from the patients who have uh, lived in the hospital, uh, so to say, and spent time. And what are the difficulties or what are, what is it that we could improve upon is what we get. So they volunteer their time um, to, to provide us the feedback. The Green Space Committee, as I said, it's not easy to give up uh, green space. So these were neighborhood uh, committee and we're talking to them about how these green spaces could be compensated. So they provide a lot of feedback. In terms of process, um, Again, the process from beginning to end is not going to look too different. In terms of number, this is what I want you to pay attention to. In the design process between schematic design and design development, we had about 800 meetings, uh, more than 800 meetings, and a lot of meetings with the administration, with 400 plus different users by the time we got to the design that was accepted. So that's how interactive um, the processes. So the uh, patient advisory committees, as I said earlier, uh, is a lot of input that you receive from uh, the patient themselves and um, uh, the families. So the upper right-hand picture that shows, so this is not related to Boston Children. This was another project at uh, Yale, uh, Yale School of Medicine. So I was designing infusion base uh, for the cancer patients, those who receive infusion as a part of the treatment. Uh, so when you talk to the cancer patients, um, they tell you different things that cancer is a disease that some days you feel like you want to be all by yourself like a turtle in the shell. And then there are other days that you feel very open, you want to share and talk to people, talk to your 
of friends and say, okay, how I'm doing. So the, the treatment goes, uh, duration of the treatment goes, varies from patient to patient, and each treatment um, timing varies from patient to patient. But just the mood swings that the patient goes through and how can your design respond to that? Um, and then we try as much as possible to, um, to be able to some spaces in the clinic could be um, out open where you can create a community environment and then some other spaces that um, that are more closed um, that they, that person doesn't feel like sharing, then you have spaces for that. Um, so, so the idea is to hear, to learn from people who really um, are using uh, these spaces. Um, in terms of other family needs, for example, we are committed Every single room has a sleeping arrangement for the family members as along with the patient. Of course, uh, there is a laundry because some of the patients live here for longer time just because the complexity of this hospital, uh, given the complex nature, um, is, is much longer than other hospitals. So laundry arrangements for, for families, they need to work remotely. They can't just be out of work. So how do you accommodate that? Um, interactive um, process with the clinicians, the users. Uh, so a lot of hands-on process that happens when we design. Uh, these are all clinicians that we are interacting with to arrive at, um, arrive at a solution. This is probably going to be different, um, something that you have not used before, uh, I'm just assuming, is testing your design. So when you have a, a patient room, for example, that you are going to repeat for 150 times, we had 150 patient rooms here, same patient rooms get repeated so many different times, you should make sure that it works. Um, that's what I mean, testing your design. So this, this is the simulation um, and a cardboard mock-up simulation that we had done. Uh, this one is uh, an operating room uh, being tested. So these surgeons and clinicians, they participate in the simulation. This is run very sophisticatedly. So the patient itself, the mannequin, has all these sensors attached and the physicians act on the patient as if it's a real patient. And those sensors and monitors will uh, will tell them how the patient is doing. Um, anyhow, so they are very serious about making sure that the space works for them. And that's what uh, we have to do is make sure this, because there is no leeway in healthcare design that things cannot be sloppy. You cannot because you're dealing with somebody's life here. So this is a simulation for operating room. So I had this debate uh, with one of my friends uh, from India. He's an architect. He now lives in Australia. Is why you guys even simulate your design. If you're doing only 150 rooms, why spend all that money? So my answer to him was, and I was texting him while I was on a bus, um, that what's a, when we say it is acceptable to crash the cars, um, every single car that comes on the road has to be tested, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, it goes through crash testing and the dummies, uh, the mannequins, again, they have the sensors and this and that to figure out where the, where the person will get hit in the accident, in certain uh, accidents, whether it's feet, hair, chest, whatever. And that's how then the designers go back and fix their cars. If you run the same math, and I'm not going to go through this line by line, if you take the best-selling car in the United States in 2020, that car would have been used by 3.9 million people um, over five years. Uh, of its lifespan. The lifespan of the model is about five years. If you take a patient room and then see how many days on average a patient stays in the room, multiply that by 365 days in a year over the life of the building, that is about 1.8 to 1.4 million people who would have used the patient room. So you don't want to carry forward the same mistake. If you make a mistake one place, you don't want to copy it over 115 times, have 1.4 million people go through your mistake. So that's how, why, that's the logic behind testing your 
uh, design. So this is a patient room that's being built uh, as if it's a real room, uh, but with the drywall, there's no ceiling there, but just to make sure they do again uh, simulate and figure out what the issues are before you uh, make it uh, repeat your mistakes 150 times. Then we develop a long list of things and the feedback that we receive from the users, and then we make adjustments. Um, this is, and this doesn't have to be any fancy. It could be done with the cardboard. It could be just one-to-one -one, uh, because we as designers can imagine space. Not everybody can. Um, even if people say on the paper to you, oh, that looks great, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that because people are not trained to read drawings. They are not trained to visualize spaces. So if you could do it in your own ways, uh, whatever the projects or things that you're working, uh, you working on, you can do this if there is space available. Um, just, just do it. Uh, in a very cheap, moderate fashion. Um, these are some regulatory, uh, I'm not going to go through uh, it. It's just a set of resources for you. So with that, I'm going to open up for questions. In the meantime, I will run this another PowerPoint, which will uh, run on its own for you to um, look at some of my work. So questions? We'll, we have just asked the uh, audience to drop in their questions. Meanwhile, I think we can uh, go ahead with your presentation. For you. um, so these are just the projects that um, I have. They, they, it's set on the um, automatic set of, uh, it just runs on its own, but I'll make it stop if you want to. So the, um, my projects are pretty much several parts of the country or uh, of the world. Um, this is the Boston Children's that I quickly talked about, uh, the roof gardens that um, that are on the roof, interior gardens um, within the hospital. So a lot of patients cannot go outside, just given some asthma issues or other mobility issues. Patient rooms, um, some interior spaces within it, um, clinics. Uh, this is a pharmacy. Uh, another shot of interior um, garden. Another hospital that I uh, worked on in Elgin, Illinois, close to Chicago. Um, this was a brand new hospital, so to say replacement hospital uh, that has a geothermal lake. All the energy to the uh, hospital comes from the lake uh, in a geothermal manner. Uh, this is Coach University Hospital. This was a gigantic project in Istanbul. Um, very different experience for me in terms of context, um, how it was used. This is one project. Uh, this is the cancer project that I was talking to you about in, with regards to a lot of feedback from the users. Um, this is a heart hospital in Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Catholic Medical Center that it's not under construction yet, but that we recently designed. Um, Michigan Children, this was a clinic um, in Detroit, Hartford Hospital, um, very dark interiors. That was the preference of the owner um, sometimes, uh, but that's the kind of interior they liked. This is a master plan for uh, Trinity Health. This is one um, PTOT, physical therapy unit that they designed for children's Leahy Clinic in Burlington. Patient rooms, ICU rooms, and some of the patient care area. This is a small rehab center after the Haiti's earthquake in 2010 uh, that I worked on. Greenwich Hospital. Um, for Ames in New Delhi, we had a proposal back in 2006, um, but then the government changed and all this, it fell apart. Uh, Bandra Kurla complex uh, in Mumbai that I worked with uh, Vivi Doshi on. Okay, so that's um, all I have in terms of my presentation. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have a question from uh, Asmita Padwada. Uh, how would you approach change in a scenario like India, 
where patients or visitors footfall is significantly larger than developed countries with tight resources and varying economic capacities of patients what would be the aspects that should get primary focus so if anybody tells you that united states is a rich country and has ton of money if anybody tells you that united states has lot of space and space is not an issue they are lying to you um because i have not worked on a single project yet that does not have constraints with regards to budget or that does not have constraints with regards to space it always is an issue so uh, i understand that uh, the the patient population is different poor and rich and this and that when i think about why healthcare uh, gets uh, it suffers compared to other spaces have you been to any ho- any hotel that is shared with another strange person any any hotel in mumbai for example every single hotel in mumbai it has its private room pretty much you are not sharing your room with another stranger even if that hotel is in the other area or in uh, any close to the airport it still offers you a private room it still offers you your own space why is it that hospitals cannot do it when you when you are in a very difficult time in your life you have to share your room with other strangers catch other people's diseases infections in my mind it's just not the priority made it, so here that used to be the case years ago not in my career but once the once you make the priority you can do it um so ch- challenge your clients challenge them why not it's not always the cost because there is willingness to pay in terms of um if if it's uh, even with the government there is a strong initiatives a strong willingness to invest um so i'm going to talk i'll just tell you this is a secret project with government of india right now that one of the it came through a foundation to us um and uh, government of india without revealing too much more about the project is planning to do cardiac hospitals not only one but they want to do several 20 different cardiac hospitals in different parts of the country and ch- children specific uh, so they came to my firm and then my firm guided them to me and then i'm i was the one that you know, kind of pointed to work on this project so and they said do whatever you want to do um they were ready to prime minister's office was ready to meet with us mm-hmm. with our time 3 o'clock in the morning uh, your time 3 o'clock in the morning or they said do whatever you want to do so the administration the mindset has changed um when i show these kinds of projects even in uh, amravati where i come from to other um people they just refuse i think uh, just as one of the slides that i showed about handicapped people it's not that you cannot do it the the designers can do it it is just needing um having that ambition to do it why why is that is there is there money as a constraint not to be able to do it it's the willingness to do it is lacking i don't know if i answered your questions or not but i think um straight away but um, i i haven't practiced too much in india but where where whatever i see the number one thing is lacking is the willingness to do it i think there's a one mention about the footfall as well i mean to say the capacity of hospitals are probably you know in terms of uh, footfall it's uh, much more uh, than uh, other countries probably as well yeah so density definitely um, so with my example of hotels in india do we talk about shortage of hotels in india we don't because there are enough hotels in india that run to accommodate travelers in every city you do go if you go open google or try to find hotel in new delhi for me i can find it find it immediately but finding a 
um, a healthcare facility to serve me, it's a task. So, uh, so density in itself is not a challenge. Yeah, so the initiative has to come on, not only from private sector, but from government as well. And which I feel now there is a big uh, change in terms of thinking. So it, it, will, it will get better. Uh, you just be a partner in the, uh, with the goal. We have next question from uh, Jyoti ma'am. Uh, she has a wonderful presentation, sir. Just wanted to know if healthcare facility projects need to go through NEPA process. And uh, I am not familiar with that. Uh, this is probably more with regards to uh, Indian situation. Here, there are different, um, and I started to get into that, but just we don't have as much time to go into. So uh, there, there are a lot of processes. Um, I think. So these, uh, I think NEPA uh, is referring to National Environmental Policy. Okay. Um, Oh, I see. So we have lead, uh, and so so to uh, as a layer to that, more specific guidelines uh, that comes with lead, and even with the uh, every state, every state has different guidelines. So United States, when you talk about, it's not one country. So to say, there are fifty countries within one country. So each state uh, has different guidelines. So some states like California, Massachusetts, are very strict about it. Some yes. other states are not. So each state has its own uh, regulatory requirements. And then it gets filtered. So the national initiative gets filtered through uh, local initiative. So it comes down to the state level, what you have to follow. Just in continuation, uh, there's one more question from Dr. Uh, Mamuli. Also would like to know about form-based codes in any of your projects. Form-based code? Yes. Uh, I didn't quite understand the question. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah. She said, like, you know, I would like to know about form based codes, if any, applicable in any of your projects. Is, are there any codes that actually you know, determine the form of um, uh, facilities? Yeah. So the form of, so, uh, form gets derived from, uh, so to say, function. So what you have seen is getting into the function. So these guidelines that you see um, on the slide here, so these guidelines were started back in 90s. Uh, they started, uh, a group of architects started to develop them. Now these guidelines have become um, more widely acceptable and that includes a lot of people from, a lot of clinicians, are involved in, in creating these guidelines. So they tell you, for example, if you're in, a, in an operating room, how big the operating room needs to be after you leave this clearance, that clearance. Uh, so that's how you come to minimum requirements. It's like telling you, you have to meet minimum standards. And then from those minimum standards you use. Uh, so the form of any hospital, for example, I don't have the plans here, but um, for example, if this was the form that this was the space available that uh, gave you the form. But if you look at the patient rooms, they were somewhere. Uh, patient rooms themselves, for example, I don't have the whole, but the patient room here on the left-hand corner, um, that minimum size came from what is in the guidelines that you have to provide uh, so much space minimum. And then from testing the room requirement, this is how the patient room is tested to make sure guidelines is one thing, but in reality, what exactly the clinicians need to function. That's how that form is developed, so to say, and then it met then it links with uh, the bigger form of the uh, space. We have a next question from one of our students, uh, Prithvi. Uh, hello, sir. Really admired your philosophy and passion for your work. I just want Thank to you. know, how do you maintain a balance between your passion for the project and practical feasibility of the project? Which one would you prioritize more? Practical feasibility. Um, 
I don't know what practical feasibility means. Um, uh, passion is something uh, that will keep you going and keep doing what you do. Um, so when it comes to practical, and I'm, I'm going to interpret in my own ways, uh, the practical feasibility, as I said, if anybody tells you that in, uh, there is plenty of money in the United States and you can do anything uh, and everything, that's not true. Every single project, we go through the constraints of space. We go, to, go through the constraints of, uh, of uh, budget. But I take up a fight. I speak my mind when it comes to safeguarding patients' health. So if, if there is a budget cuts that are made, that will compromise patients' health. I, I pick up a big fight about that in terms of, you know, I speak my mind when it comes to patients' health and safety. But if there are other things that you have to compromise on, which we always do, um, if, if there are spaces that are not necessarily, so you have to prioritize, okay, if my center of my attention is the patient, I don't want to cut back on any, any provisions made for the patient. If there are other provisions that I can cut back, sure. Uh, and that happens on every single project that you work on, that your budget is uh, a constraint. Um, and then we have to always, almost always cut back on design. But if your priority is, uh, in my case, is the patient, then you have to pick up a fight and say, okay, you can't cut back on those. Uh, I think uh, when you mentioned uh, the question was about practical feasibility, you talked quite at length, like, you know, uh, having mock-ups in place, involving all the stakeholders, like all the like, steering committee members and, you know, so I mean, everyone who's going to be part of uh, the project, you are actually involving them and getting their feedbacks. So I think probably that's what uh, is all about, you know, getting, uh, making it a practically feasible. That's right. Yeah, yeah one more pro uh, question from Gauri Kundale. Hi, sir. It was an amazing presentation. Can you please share the scope of Indian students in USA at present condition? Um, so we need a lot of people to work. Uh, so architecture goes in a swings in terms of uh, demand um, as the economy does well, generally speaking. Architects do well as the economy goes down. Architects are not as busy. Um, that's that's how it is probably uh, everywhere. Currently speaking, uh, I would hire you or anybody that's available, you know, um, quickly. So Indian students in the university, there are so many avenues. Um, scope wise, if I did it, what thirty years ago now. Um, that was the time with no Google, no internet, no nothing. Um, you can do it. Um, there are a ton of uh, opportunities available in every single state. There are multiple schools and colleges that can offer you a school of, um, for you to grow. So somebody had asked this question to one of the speakers, I think a couple of days ago or last week, is whether it's worth doing masters. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say... I'm going to answer this question in my own ways. Um, I'm going to say the school, what you learn in school uh, is very limited in terms of books, in terms of uh, syllabus that you learn. Any school that you go to, you are exposed to a new environment. You are exposed to new set of thinking. So what you're going to take with you is that exposure that will help you with your own uh, problem solving approach. Yeah. It's not going to be practical. As I said, my very first slide that I had was about attitude. It was not about mm -hmm. what you learned so much uh, with regards to school. In my own career, how much of urban and regional planning I'm applying to these solutions is questionable. But whether I spent my time in SEPT was it worth? It definitely was because it exposed me to an entirely different environment. School of Design Planning uh, in or SEPT as an institution is a very different institution than compared to all others. But what I learned in the syllabus, maybe I apply 0.5% of it in today. Um, but in terms of how it made me grow, how it made me think, how I uh, grew as a person, 
is what uh, is what probably contributed to that exposure so the school and the curriculum itself may not help you too much uh, but exposure is what counts yes i think very well said you know it's it's all about our attitude you know and how do you want to develop it further uh, we have Thank next you. question from nitin patel uh, hi why do uninsured americans still flock to india for their medical treatment in spite of world class facilities is this due to the massive setup cost of hospitals or any other parameters no it has uh, nothing to do with the cost of the hospitals um so unfortunately uh, the whole industry or healthcare is driven here by uh, insurance um so 50% of it comes from welfare which is from government so uh, the remaining 50% comes from uh, insurance companies so the unfortunately poor people who do not buy insurance and then when they get into an issue uh, they have to pay out of pocket paying out of pocket here is not easy the healthcare cost is immense so it's not so what so there 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 are so many loopholes in the system that drives the cost it's not architecture in itself because just if you think of a pipeline that has multiple holes healthcare system has multiple holes in this pipe it's not architecture itself architecture probably contributes very little in terms of the cost of healthcare just the operational cost and the leakages that happen in the healthcare system are immense um so uh, it is an issue that uninsured uh, population does not get served well and when you have to pay out of pocket uh it's going to hurt you you are going to pay for rest of your life so compared to uh cost in india the cost of healthcare is very little here just just the cost of education is so much more if you were to go as a medical student in a uh, to graduate as a doctor to graduate with 10 years is what minimum you, uh, it takes 10 to 12 years for you to graduate the cost of graduation itself is about a million dollar for you to graduate from dental uh, in in any medical school so that gets passed along of course now if you if i have spent million dollars on my graduation that that is going to make everything else expensive um so so nitin it's not necessarily architecture that's contributing to the cost of healthcare yes i think probably it's to do with the quality uh, control right from the education thing there are services that are made available so when obama was uh, president he passed that affordable care act um and that was just to capture the population that is underserved so if you are not paying for insurance out of your pocket um then that was the effort to to be able to capture that population um so whether it has succeeded 100% no uh, but there are some holes within that but that was the marketplace open for anybody in who doesn't have insurance to buy insurance and subsidize so to say um or low cost healthcare insurance but then there are some people about 10 to 15% who just don't buy insurance Yeah, we have and next then question. when so we have next question from ayush hazare uh, being in healthcare architecture while designing do you face any restrictions in terms of creativity and design while dealing with legalities probably i think even to say that you know it's uh, healthcare is more of a function driven uh, you know uh, projects so do you really <laughs> Uh, they are but my argument would be do you see any of these projects that are all regulated in terms of uh, how they um, should be or what the minimum requirements if you can point me to one of the picture that you say uh, that is ugly and then i would say yes that it is ugly because because of the regulations um if you can point to me any of the projects that you see on screen and there are many more um, creative architecture it's not the creativity that gets stunt by by regulation what what how how are you creative if there is no restriction 
the whole word creativity comes from the set of restrictions. If, if I have a blank canvas, which is very challenging to paint something on, if the canvas didn't have any limitations, if it, it had no boundaries. So, so just having the boundaries doesn't mean that it's limited um, by regulations. So if you see it, if you comment on any of these, that these are ugly spaces, then I would say, yeah, I was restricted. But just as the one um, slide that I showed you, so, so following um, handicap accessibility in these spaces, are these bad spaces? They are not. They are just saying that we have to incorporate handicap accessibility in these spaces. In my mind, those are beautiful spaces. They also reg uh, follow regulations and they also serve the community that is underserved, which is handicapped people. Yes, I think uh, the next question is somewhat on the similar lines it's from Satyendra Bhagat. A wonderful presentation which explained a very specific process. With all due respect to the process that is followed, do you sometimes feel that it is more mechanical process where we are trying to understand people like machine, can it possibly make it more too specific and rigid where we are actually going away from the diversity which comes from the variables of very human nature and behavioral patterns and emotional, emotional responses? Um. I, I don't think the process is uh, mechanical. It's trying to reach out uh, instead of designing with the blinders on, at least we are trying to reach out to, as I said, I don't have to be a cancer patient myself to design something or myself to understand what cancer patient goes through. But at least when I interview a cancer patient or a bunch of them, I understand what they go through. And you could never design anything that fits everybody. Uh, so to say, you cannot customize your design to fit everybody. So there is going to be some people uh, that are that will say, okay, you designed um, for 90% people, but the 10% people are left out. You didn't hear me. Um, but at least I'm not designing in vacuum, imagining that what cancer patient goes through. At least I am trying to make an attempt to reach out to people that uh, go through. Uh, I don't know why Why would you think that's a mechanical process. It's, it's at least making an effort to reach out um, than sitting at my studio and drawing or imagining spaces for somebody else. We have an expression from uh, Vasanti Londe, ma'am. Uh, very different and wonderful presentation. Focused on what kind of mindset students should prepare for future. Mr. Nilai's presentation reflected his attitude when he addressed the listeners or students need first. Then later he showed his projects where he gave detailed attention to users' need in his design. Truly commendable. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have next question from Nuvo Designs. Says, are there any urban design guidelines that you need to follow in your uh, during the design process? Yeah. So, with regards to urban design, and I just didn't have uh, time to get into that. Uh, of course, uh, let me get to one slide here. So, as you would notice here, so there is uh, definitely with regards to urban uh, guidelines, setback requirements and the height restrictions and all that, um, that's definitely there. For example, the, this hospital could have gone up by more stories, but just the height restrictions was one thing and the flight path. So the neighboring hospital has a um, helipad on top and we had to calculate the helipad, uh, the flight path for the for the helicopter and the requirements for aviation um, industry. Other than that, there are, you know, with regards to urban um, guidelines. So if you see this small little portico here that looks historical, mm -hmm. this, there was a building here that was demolished. That was also uh, our form is um, very old form that was designed by our own form back in uh, 
1800 something um what what it looked like this building over here on the right hand side like medical school uh, harvard medical school building so the landmark commission here in boston said you cannot just demolish that building you have to bring some historic context in your building so to say you have to preserve it so we had to make a lot of efforts in with regards to that this is in my mind is for namesake and there is an interior shot uh, here this is the new interior lobby keeping the facade as it was um, historically we reuse the doors and some of the windows and stuff from the old building but um, with regards to other guidelines there are definitely ur urban guidelines that we have to follow in terms of how much space how tall the building could be the setbacks and the regulations every single thing on the uh, this is called lma uh, longwood avenue medical center Every single elevation that we create here has to go through Boston Landmark Commission to approve whether this architecture is acceptable or not. Boston is one, uh, it's not only with regards to Boston, but Boston is uh, one unique city in the US has very different character of architecture that you have to maintain, you have to respect. Um, so yes, short answer is there are bunch of regulations that we have to go through yes just now uh, from it's uh, out of uh, like the number of projects that we have shown uh, in india normally we say a private hospital and a government hospital so is the similar terminology followed there or like you know how how is it different or works on the similar lines so so in the us government hospitals are only uh, va hospital which are uh, for um, for veterans all other hospitals are on their own. These are mostly nonprofit organizations. So, so what you are seeing on the screen is a nonprofit organization. Uh, it's neither government nor private. So all of their money goes back to providing care. So nobody is making money here in terms of you know stacking money away. So by end of the year, all that money goes back into providing care. So there are there are hardly any. Uh, private hospitals here. Um, there are some private clinics, but those are very small. Um, but in terms of hospital, they are mostly um, non-profit organized. I think this is the one of the biggest difference. Uh, I think so. I think uh, next uh, message is a comment from uh, architect Arjun Hablani, who is the roommate of Atul Jain. He says that... Nilay missing those college days at hostel where he used to guide us. Please convey this message to him. <laughs> oh, thank you. I remember her too now, of course. We have next question from Aditya Wale. He's one of our students. Healthcare project in India is going towards energy efficient design nowadays. Is there any new tools to use energy more efficiently in future designs? Yeah, so the hospitals here tend to be number one consumers of energy um, so back in india you could use multiple uh, tools so this project for example this was um, the first project that i worked on um, so this lake lake had a purpose so this humongous lake that was a man-made lake it wasn't um, it wasn't there before so this uses geothermal energy so the heat exchange happens through the lakes, uh, minus 58 degrees, oh, sorry, 58 degrees Celsius of Fahrenheit, uh, water temperature that remains constant through winter and summer. So just because the healthcare projects tend to be so heavy in terms of energy consumption, um, so these all these pipes that you see, the manifold, so a lot, a bunch of pipes. Now I regret that I didn't include those pictures, but anyhow. Um, so this is this lake provides energy for this hospital, um, majority of it. Uh, there are certain uh, spaces that you cannot rely on geothermal. Um, then there is solar, then there are energy efficient, you know, wind is not uh, quite practical. Um, even the solar is limited uh, in terms of your own supply. So the geothermal, just because this hospital happened to have so much land, we made that man-made lake uh, as a source of energy. Uh, with regards to India, I think we uh, we are missing out on solar 
but solar also takes space. You need a lot of panels, a lot of space to install them. Uh, my brother-in-law's hospital, they use solar panels on, on their roof. They use it to, for hot water. So they, they provide um, not for electricity, but hot water. So do whatever you can. But I do agree that uh, healthcare hospitals in general take up a lot of energy. Um, and this was one of the examples how you can provide supplemental source. We have one comment actually from Ramakant Buddha. Fantastic, Nila. Hats off. Reminds me of your attitude in college days too. No change. Oh, that's great. Uh, so uh, that is a, a kind comment, Ramakant. Uh, so if the attitude has not changed, that means I have done well. <laughs> <laughs> we have next question from Sakshi Vaman. Uh, about the testing of design and mockups. Are they or can they be done feasibly as the project scale increases? Uh, not only for internal spaces. I mean, uh, for spaces. the exter exter exterior, and again, I don't have the slides here to show exterior. We do do uh, exterior mock up as well, not the whole building, but the building facade. Um, so, if um, for every single project, for example, this uh, building skin, the glass panels here and the whole whole assembly uh, exterior assembly was marked up to make sure that it um, here in the United States the weather is so such a challenge to deal with um, because not only earthquakes not only uh, wind not only thermal changes that goes from minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way to 110 degrees Fahrenheit so to test the assembly the building assembly we do do mock-up and it does get tested in terms of uh, thermal performance uh, whether it's going to leak somewhere whether it's going to have a dew point somewhere in the middle of the uh, assembly whether you are going to have moisture uh, that just because of the temperature difference is so vast that the moisture from outside in or out inside out could leak into the uh, cavity itself. So we do do those mock-ups, um, not a full scale, of course, but um, the whole assembly gets mocked up for exterior design. Okay. Uh, we have next question from Mayank Barjatia. Hi, Nile, amazing work. Do you consider oh, thank you. geobiology, EMF, and e-smog in your hospital designs, especially for cancer hospitals? To be honest, I these are new terms for me. Uh, geobiology is I don't even know what it is. Uh, can can he expand? Um, we can go to the next question and he can come back. Uh, but uh, these are all in a way new terms for me. My apologies. Yeah, I think I'll I'll have a last question from. Uh, uh, yeah, we have. Uh, what advice as an alumni you will give to our students? <laughs> uh, I, I'm surprised that even is a question because I think first 10 slides that I gave you, um, not my work, but uh, the other ones, the 10 things that if you can take with you mm -hmm. is my advice. The number one is have go out as a blank slate. Um, don't carry your burden with you that you know a lot. Um, if you think you know a lot, there are a lot of people who know a lot more than you. So uh, be able to learn, um, have that positive attitude towards learning. These individuals that came right out of college to work with me, uh, that is what they had is ability to learn. Nobody said, oh, I went to this school of uh, this school of architecture, that school of architecture. I came from Harvard and I came from MIT. That would not help too much. So don't carry that burden that you belong to this school and that school and you were one of the first merit students in the college. It won't matter because it. I will remember that you would you you were a married student and you got first class and you got 90 out of 100 that i will remember for two days and on third day i want 
you to work with me. Keeping that aside, that doesn't help me. Whether I would work with a person from Harvard or MIT, or whether I would work with an, any other person who has a right attitude, I will choose a right, right attitude over your degree. So um, if nothing else, go out there as a blank slate, be able to absorb. Um, don't, just as I said in this bullet point here, stone doesn't absorb water, sponge does. So go like a sponge, forget about what you know. Uh, I think you started your journey uh, working with B.V. Doshi sir and uh, Charles Korea sir, B.V. Doshi sir and went on to you know, uh, much more larger picture. Uh, what uh, What is the piece of practical advice you would give to someone who is uh, just starting out? Um, starting, so you don't have to work for these uh, personalities at all. Um, because it, I, it, I just happen to be lucky, and I don't know how it happened, uh, and how I deserve to be working with Charles Korea, but it happened with. It doesn't mean that you have to work with uh, these amazing people, and if you look carefully, that I don't draw these qualities or learnings for myself only from these people. They, they were, they are big. They were big personalities, and there is a lot to learn from individuals like that but you don't have to work for somebody like that. Uh, so in my walk of life, I have all these people that, that I learned many things from. These are not amazing individuals. These are amazing the, in their own ways. Uh, they may not be well known. I'm sure none of you heard a lot of other personalities that I used in my presentation. These are people like you and me. And we all have something or other to take from. So don't get engaged into what somebody is not. But take what they are. And there is always good and bad. So if you are working for anybody um, as a young graduate out of school, uh, you don't have to work for these you know, big architects. You can work for anybody. It depends on what you, what you do, what your approach is. Uh, I think nowadays we hear a lot about healthcare tourism. So, mm -hmm. I uh, do you have any comments on this? So, healthcare tourism, uh, because again, affordability, it's not um, not too many of Americans go out uh, as a tourist, but uh, from uh, to India. But a lot of people do go from Middle East and other African countries to India to receive. Uh, treatment. It's all driven by um, by uh, money because healthcare in India is much more affordable than other countries. So when I think about it is because why is it affordable? Uh, my Both my in-laws, they are doctors. How much money did they spend in terms of their education? They spent zero. They they went. They both went to government schools to get their education. They had no burden of loans, and they had no burden on them. Uh, and nothing negative. It's just that the healthcare that they provide to uh, society is not going to have that burden of um, I paid million dollars for my education that I have to pay back. They don't. Um, so automatically, the healthcare uh, that they provide is going to be much more affordable than you would get in other countries. And in terms of resources, a um, lot of lot of money goes into research, at least in the United States, in terms of research on healthcare. That is expensive. In India, we have so to say, photocopy machine for research. We have all the medicine that is available, but most of it, or almost you can probably count on fingers, is developed in India. Um, very little is developed in India. We produce a lot of medicine. We, you know, I hear these terms that India is pharmacy for the world and all that, but that's all photocopy not original research. So in Western countries, a lot of money has been spent on research. Uh, and a lot of that eventually is going to find its way um, to the patient who ultimately pays for it. So uh, that makes healthcare uh, in India much more affordable than, than in the United States or in, the, in Europe. 
uh, and that's the term the healthcare tourism comes from. If we can provide, I have no negative comments about it, that if we are able to serve the people who are underserved, we should, and we should take great advantage of that um, and don't make it expensive, keep it low, but make it widely available. Yes, I think very well said. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions pouring in, but due to lack of time, uh, we'll, we'll stop here in terms of presentations and then I'll hand it over to our honorable principal member. Okay. For the if anybody uh, does have, I'm more than happy to, uh, I, I was planning on putting my contact information here, which I didn't, but um, I can pass on my contact information to you. And if anybody uh, does, they can email me, um, message me, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Nilay, sir. Thanks for amazing presentation. And more so about the 10 pointers that you have mentioned. I'm sure that everybody can uh, you know, take away that message from this international webinar series. Uh, very good conclusion to the uh, alumni webinar series, I, I must say. Uh, this is a very proud moment for MMCOA when our alumni are talking to our uh, current students. And to conclude this series, I would also like to announce that we are publishing a booklet of this webinar series. And uh, this, this will give, give everybody a brief introduction of our speakers, as well as the overview of the work that uh, they have carried out so far. So this will be available on the uh, Alma Shine portal as well as our website. I extend my uh, gratitude to all the esteemed speakers of this webinar series, uh, architect Jyoti Gugle, architect Dheera Jakolkar, architect Nachiket Garge, architect Sohan Sara, and Nilay Deshmukh sir for your insightful sessions. Your journey and soulful interaction was really outstanding. I'm sure that we'll cherish these learnings for, from your varied experiences. Uh, I thank each and everyone for your presence and contribution towards this webinar series. I could see a lot of uh, senior architects, senior faculty members who have taught our alumni, who have presented their work in this particular series. Uh, practicing architects, alumni, friends, uh, who took time from their busy schedule and attended this session. Uh, my sincere thanks to you all. I would like to thank our webinar team, MMCO alumni coordinator, and the international webinar coordinator, Professor Arti Patil, who has coordinated this webinar series quite diligently. Professor Sachin Baman for uh, lively question answer sessions. Uh, Professor Shonak Naik, Professor Smita Patil, and Sagar Vaga, uh, who were part of our backstage team, a perfect supporting for all the possible arrangements that we could have for this international webinar. I would like to thank all the honorable members of Maratwada Mitra Mandal who extended their constant support for all our activities. And with this note, I again thank one and all for your participation to MMCOS five days five alumni, five international cities, and a standing invitation for all the alumni to visit college whenever possible. And we look forward to welcome you all to the Institute. Thanks a lot. And have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.